Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum of the Institute of Politics of Harvard University, a space committed to thoughtful and respectful political discussion and debate. My name is Marilee Grindle. I'm a professor here at the Kennedy School, and I am the director of the university's David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, which is co-sponsoring this event. On behalf of Dean David Elwood, I would like to in, uh, welcome President Santos and his uh, wife, the First Lady, Maria Clemencia Rodriguez, and their son, Martin. I'd like to uh, also welcome Ambassador Carlos Ur uh, Urritia, Council General Monica Pinzon, officials of the Colombian government, leaders of political parties and Congress in Colombia, the, and certainly a uh, very special welcome to our Governor Duval Patrick of Massachusetts uh, and members of the Colombian community in the Boston area. Welcome to students, to faculty, and to our other guests. We are so very, very pleased to see you. We are all looking forward to hearing from President Santos. And now it is my very great pleasure to introduce Jorge Dominguez, who is the Vice Provost for International Affairs at Harvard University, and he will introduce the President. Jorge Dominguez is the Antonio Madero Professor for the Study of Mexico, and he teaches in the Government Department. As a professor, he has inspired generations of students to study about Latin America, to write about its history, its economics, its environment, and its cultures. And he has inspired them to travel to the region, to work, to carry out research, and to contribute in a multitude of ways to the countries and peoples of the region. He has also written a large number of excellent and groundbreaking books and articles about Latin America and US-Latin American relations helping us understand important issues, and perhaps more importantly, keeping us asking important questions. As Vice Provost for International Affairs, he has been extraordinarily active in helping this university become more international in terms of the students it recruits, the discussions and debates it engages, and the ways in which it is involved in the world. Those of us who believe in a globally informed and engaged Harvard University owe him an enormous debt of gratitude. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Marilee, um, Mr. Governor, uh, members of the Harvard community and friends, uh, it is an honor to welcome to the Harvard Kennedy School and to the university um, Juan Manuel Santos, President of the Republic of Colombia. Um, this forum, as Professor Grindle uh, indicated, uh, has been devoted for many years to uh, understanding, to debate, uh, to respectful dialogue, and we know that uh, this evening uh, will be such. Uh, Juan Manuel Santos has had a distinguished career uh, in a variety of roles uh, as a journalist in the newspaper El Tiempo, uh, as Minister of Foreign Trade, as Finance Minister, as Defense Minister, uh, has devoted uh, uh, efforts over a long period of time uh, to seek to achieve peace under the rule of law in Colombia, uh, to strengthen the Colombian state so that it can honor its obligations to its citizens under the Constitution, to seek to ensure the prosperity of the people of Colombia uh, and their broad participation, reflected in, to a significant degree in the massive support that he received on his election as President of Colombia uh, in 2010. Uh, for all of those reasons, of course, uh, I am honored to welcome him this evening. But I'm also pleased uh, because uh, he has a long-standing association with the university. 
uh, as a graduate of the Kennedy School of Government in 1981, as a Nieman Fellow in 1988, and more generally because he and I met not only at that time but continued to know each other through other activities, in particular the role and his work and his leadership of the Inter-American Dialogue, an entity that seeks to bring together uh, people from all countries, so nearly all countries of the hemisphere, to advance common purposes to which he has dedicated so much of his life as a public servant, as now as President of Columbia. Mr. President, on behalf of all of us, uh, welcome to the university. Juan well, Manuel, welcome home. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jorge, for your kind words. He's been my permanent professor from many, many years ago. And uh, I am very, very happy to be here. Mr. Governor, uh, thank you for your recent uh, visit to Colombia. And I, you know you will always be welcome back. And the relations between the state of Massachusetts and Colombia, I hope we can improve them more and more every day. The director of the Institute of Politics, Thank you very much for having me here. And thank you all for giving me this opportunity. I really feel very happy to be back at the Kennedy School. I remember uh, sitting down on those uh, stairs many hours studying. And what I learned here, I've been applying throughout my uh, public uh, life. I. I remember especially well one course it was called The Uses of History, Professor Neustadt and uh, Professor May. And uh, that course uh, taught me in a way how to use in the best way possible uh, history to take decisions, decisions that uh, are useful in this responsibility of uh, government. I learned, for example, that uh, the art of governing in a way is similar to the art of navigating, of sailing, and that therefore you, you need to have a port of destiny. You need to know where you want to go, and if you have a clear port of destiny, uh, the work and uh, the problems uh, become easier. And I've tried to apply that. And I learned how to sail in, in the Colombian Navy. So when I learned about this uh, analogy, I started to apply the principles of sailing to the principles of government. And uh, by defining that port of destiny, I also tried to use history. Uh, one of the worst uh, and most severe problems that my country has faced for many decades has been the problem of violence and security. And their history again comes in, in, into play by saying, as the Romans used to say when they created the concept of a republic, the first law should be security. Without security, the rest of the laws become very difficult to uh, operate, to become uh, real laws. So th that was one of the first objectives that uh, I put as a priority in my government, make Colombia more secure. A second objective, um, and again using the example of history, is the need to modernize the country, constantly modernize the country. And there are many examples in the world, in the history uh, of uh, success in this aspect. One of the examples that I, uh, I uh, investigated and tried to apply to our government uh, was uh, Singapore, how they modernized their economy, how they modernize the country, and we've been trying to modernize uh, 
uh, our economy, our country. And that is a sort of a s second uh, fundamental objective. And the third one is uh, something that uh, throughout history, any country that wants to be a decent country, any democracy that wants to be a decent democracy must always strive for freedom and justice. Be a, a more equitable country where the difference between the rich and the poor could narrow, the difference between the rich r regions and the poorest regions can narrow, uh, can, uh, can become uh, uh, more, uh, more easy to, to handle those differences. Uh, this is something that you will always have to have present. So that was a third uh, main objective when we were uh, designing our development plan. And we have made tremendous progress in those three areas. In terms of security, my, my predecessor put in place what he called uh, democratic security, and by the word democratic meant security for everybody, and security using the rule of law, using our democratic uh, means to, to achieve a more secure country. I was his minister of uh, defense. I made some changes in, in the concept of security, but more of a, a practical uh, change in terms of being more effective. And uh, I learned also by using uh, and by studying history the importance of intelligence in, in any of the military operations and in any uh, conflicts, especially when you have at the other side uh, organized crime, drug trafficking, and guerrillas. Uh, you need a lot of intelligence, and that's one of the first things I did when I, when I uh, was appointed Minister of Defense, and then when I became President, I reinforced this intelligence, and that has allowed Colombia to, to improve dramatically the security of the country. Uh, we still have a conflict. We still have problems, of course, but uh, Colombia today, uh, no doubt whatsoever, is more secure uh, than it was three years ago, and three years ago definitely was more secure than uh, Colombia 10 or 15 years ago. We were on the verge 15 years ago or less of being declared a failed state. Today, we are being uh, signaled as a uh, effective uh, uh, and uh, workable democracy where things happen, where the public policies st uh, have results, and this is a dramatic change that we have been able to make in, in our country. And in terms of security, we need to persevere. This is something that also history teaches us. Uh, you cannot lower your guard, uh, not one single day. Uh, we have different types of security, uh, of security problems, and on the different fronts, you need to persevere. In terms of modernizing the country, um, we had uh, accumulated a, a deficit in our infrastructure because that is something that is very uh, easy to cut when you have fiscal problems. And Colombia has had fiscal problems for many decades. And so I was Minister of Finance uh, in a very uh, difficult moment. And I remember saying, what should we cut in the budget? Of course, infrastructure was the, the place to make the most dramatic cuts. It's politically less costly. And because if you cut education, if you cut health, if you cut other sectors, this has a very high political cost. So we had accumulated a, a deficit in infrastructure. But if we wanted to be a modern country, we had to uh, uh, solve this, this deficit. And that's why we put in place a very uh, ambitious and, and audacious 
uh, infrastructure policy that is now starting to work. Uh, just to give you a, an example of the magnitude of the change, we, uh, in the last 15 years, spent uh, on average uh, 3 billion pesos uh, in infrastructure. Uh, at this very moment, we are opening bids for uh, roughly 47 billion pesos. Uh, so this is going to produce a dramatic change, and it's starting to produce a dramatic change in our infrastructure, which has a, a important change in, in uh, our competitiveness, which is something that a modern country must always try to achieve. Uh, the more competitive you are, the best, the more, the better performance you're going to, to get. Another very important step that we took at the beginning of the government had to do with technology, the use of technology. As you all know better than I do, uh, technology is changing in, on a, with an exponential speed. And the effect of technology in, in the uh, development of a country it can be dramatic. I, I uh, mentioned an anecdote that I had, an experience that I had, which, which uh, impressed me very much. Um, you, m many of you know the Media Lab in MIT. Uh, Nicolas Negroponti uh, called me one day and said, uh, why don't we, make, why don't we uh, uh, try out an idea that I have? And I said, uh, what idea do you have? And I said, we have some laptops. Uh, why don't we go to a very remote town and give laptops to every child in the town. And we send some, some teachers to teach the child to use the laptops. And I thought it was uh, an interesting idea. And uh, so we went to a very remote area where you didn't have television signal. You didn't even have cellular signal. It was uh, like a ghost town, isolated. We had to put a military antenna, but we took uh, roughly about 380 laptops because there were 380 children. And we sent some teachers. And uh, Nicholas and I went about two months later. And the, the, what we found was really shocking in the positive sense. The kids had taken over the town. And they were, they were uh, giving orders to their parents. And their parents were behind asking them, uh, how do you do this, how do you do that? And it was an extraordinary experience. And I, I realized how, how important it was to, to use technology in order to, to speed up development. So when I won the elections, I uh, said to my minister of technology, uh, why don't we connect as many municipalities as possible with f broadband and fiber optic. And he said, okay, we have 1,200 municipalities, uh, uh, 1,200, 1,200 municipalities, and uh, we said, let's, let's strive for 400. But we started and it was, the, the effect was so positive that we are now uh, over 850, and we will end the government with every single municipality, even in the most remote areas, with broadband and fiber optic. But then we said to, to each other, how are we going to stimulate the use of that technology? So we are, we are uh, investing a, a big amount of money in buying computers and tablets, the, the, the best possible quality, and we are giving to the, especially the, the poorest children of Colombia, uh, access to tablets and, to, and, and computers. And uh, we, are, we are building more than 6,000 what we call digital centers. 
And this is having a tremendous effect in the way the people perceive technology. They're getting acquainted and they learn very fast. And uh, there is another step that we're using to modernize uh, and rapidly the country and uh, the economy. And I could carry on telling you other steps on modernization, but uh, let me go to the, to the last one, to the last priority. In order to be sustainable in the long run, any country, uh, you have to have a minimum uh, social agenda that works. Uh, Con Colombia was the most unequal country in the whole of Latin America, with the exception of Haiti. And uh, this was uh, shameful. I, I felt uh, very, very bad saying this and, and acknowledging this. And so we said in the campaign, we must address with more effectiveness this social agenda. And we put in place some specific policies to address this problem. And uh, so far in the last, last three years, we have been able to get very good results. Uh, Colombia uh, with Peru have been the two countries in the last three years that have been able to reduce poverty in percentage wise the most, uh, roughly six and a half percent according to uh, some indicators or four and a half percent according to others. But I think uh, as is important is that we broke up perverse trend that we had in Colombia, where we grew as an economy and a country, but it was a perverse growth because inequality grew also. The rich got richer and the poor got poor. And that's what we broke. And the trend uh, finally uh, is now uh, towards more, uh, a more equal country, uh, the income of the lo lower strata has increased six times faster than the income of the upper strata. And this has allowed us to uh, improve our, what you call, the, the economists call the Gini coefficient uh, in a substantial way. And now today, we can already say that we are not the second most unequal country in Latin America. We're more or less average. We have a long way to go still we have still more than 30% of our people in poverty. Uh, and uh, the, the gap between the rich and the poor and the rich regions and the poor regions is still very high. But the trend is now uh, positive. And I think this is a, a major achievement of which I am very proud. And I think, and we have been signaled out uh, by, for example, the uh, Human Development and Poverty Center of Oxford University as an example uh, of an effective social policy. Uh, the Nobel Prize winner, Amir Sen, who was a teacher here at Harvard when I was here, uh, I was very pleased when he said, listen, you were chosen, your country, as an example of an effective social policy. Um, we are giving Tremendous importance to something that you have wide uh, knowledge about and know, you understand the importance, which is education. And last year, I made uh, education free, completely free, to all Colombians from, uh, that go to public schools from kindergarten to 11th grade. And we're now improving the uh, quality of the education through different means. We are applying to become members and we have been accepted already members of the OECD. This is, as you know, the, the club of, I call it, not of rich countries, but of countries with the best practices in order to have a good benchmark of our public policies. And this has helped us, and especially in the education, to start upgrading the quality of our education. We have expanded the uh, quite a bit the access of um, university students to university and we're promoting very much the, the creation of technical centers 
to uh, train and, and, and give the necessary preparation of, uh, in the technical area to, to many of our, our students, especially the graduates from, from high school. And there, of course, this is a long-term investment, but uh, this is a very important investment. Of course, uh, uh, all these results, for example, the, the economy, this is another uh, sort of a transversal priority that we had. We need a, uh, a stable and a strong economy. Otherwise, the rest of the efforts will be very difficult to to achieve, uh, the objective will be very difficult to achieve. And so we, we decided to, to work on, on a series of, of decisions, of policies, of reforms that will give us a, a strong economy and not only a strong economy for one time, but a sustainable economy in, in the future. And we put in place policies that are working very well. For example, we received uh, the economy with a deficit of uh, 18 billion pesos. Last year, we ended up with a surplus of 2 billion pesos. And at the same time, we locked in uh, what we call fiscal responsibility through a constitutional reform and a legal reform uh, called the fiscal rule, which will uh, oblige any government mine or any government to spend within certain limits and, and prevent what uh, here the US is living or the Europe is living to accumulate deficit after deficit and suddenly the economy explodes. And I learned when I was Minister of Finance that this is a fundamental um, right that people should also uh, demand from a government. Because when I was Minister of Finance, I had to administer the worst economic crisis that the country had uh, suffered in the last 100 years. And I, I saw clearly, I, I, I had to take decisions that really uh, violated fundamental rights. Uh, I had to, to cut is expenditure in areas where people simply were out of a job or could not go to school or even uh, in health, the hospitals. And, and so having a, a good ma macroeconomic environment is as important as the right to work, as the right to uh, a good health system, as a right to a good education. And it was a, a marvelous um, discussion in, in Congress. Uh, it was a f political, philosophical discussion of, uh, is this a, a fundamental right? Or should be treated as a fundamental right? And we succeeded to, in approving a law that in a way locks in and guarantees uh, fiscal responsibility in the future. And that has created tremendous confidence in the economy. And immediately our, our spreads went down, our, the interest rates went down. We now have uh, great access to the international markets at a very low cost, low compared to what we had before. And so this is a virtuous circle that we have been constructing. Uh, another thing that we have done quite successfully is uh, the creation of employment. We have been able to reduce unemployment month after month for, for 36 months in a row. Uh, not one single month has unemployment increased compared to the same month the year before. We have created more jobs than any other country in Latin America, and formal jobs, which is very important. Before we created jobs, but, but they, they were informal jobs. So all this is adding up to creating a, an environment which is quite positive. Of course, we have many problems. Um, people ask me, why were you able to have these reforms approved in Congress, very difficult reforms? Another big reform that we did was uh, 
the, the redistribution of our royalties, uh, that we decided to redistribute the royalties with a much more equitable basis. And I said, well, we have something which is very scarce in today's world, uh, governability, the ability to govern. And uh, we acquired the ability to govern also using the lessons of history. Uh, this time was the lesson of uh, a former great American president, Abraham Lincoln, when he invited his rivals to become part of the government. And that is exactly what I did. When I won the election, I told my former rivals, uh, listen, you're different. You're, what, you are, what you were proposing in the campaign is not very, very different from what, I, what I'm proposing. Why don't we get together and agree and join the government? And we were able to create a very strong and uh, effective coalition. We call it the national unity. Uh, we managed to have almost 90% of the Congress. And that has allowed us to uh, pass constitutional reforms and uh, legal reforms in an unprecedented way. Uh, never before, I think, uh, had we been able to approve such uh, drastic and, I think, positive reforms. And so that has been the basis for the results that we are now seeing. And uh, of course, all this uh, has been done in the middle of a conflict, of a war, more than 50 years. Uh, we have had wars with the guerrillas. That has been, uh, the, the drug trafficking has been like a poisonous arrow that has penetrated all of our violence. And uh, we have, and I had, this, uh, uh, I have decided to also learn from history. Uh, every war should end through a negotiated agreement. You need to try to sit down and negotiate uh, the end of the war. First, you need to uh, do everything possible to convince the other side that it's in their interest to negotiate. And that's why the military offensive was very hard, very strong, and very effective. And then the offer of a peace agreement. And uh, that's where we are right now. Um, we are negotiating in Havana, um, and I hope that we can end a 50 years of war which will, in a way, liberate the real potential of my country. Uh, because this potential has been restrained. Uh, there was like a break uh, by, a, by this conflict. Uh, investment, the perception of the country, the way people, uh, for example, invest in the countryside. They invest very short term. The presence of the conflict has been a nuisance. The problem is that we have been got accustomed to, to the conflict. And like it was a day-to-day -day, uh, situation, a normal situation, this is very bad for any society. So we are trying to get rid of this conflict, uh, trying to convince the guerrillas to change their bullets for votes, to change their arms for arguments, and to continue the struggle but through democratic means. And uh, they will have all the guarantees, and I hope they realize that this is a great opportunity for them. It would be a great opportunity for the whole country. And if we achieve this peace, then the other objectives will be, uh, will be much easier to realize, to, to obtain. Uh, it's not easy. I can tell you something which is, I've experienced it uh, personally. It's much easier to wage war than to try to achieve peace. Uh, much more popular to wage war politically. When you wage a war and you have the upper hand, uh, this is a very 
a popular thing to do. And you show the bodies of your enemies and people applaud. But trying to make peace uh, has all kinds of difficulties. First of all, there are enemies of the peace, people who don't like peace or who live out of war. Uh, and uh, these people take advantage of the contradictions of a peace process. For example, I put two conditions uh, since the beginning of this peace process. One condition is no ceasefire until we reach an agreement. Why did I did, did, did I did this? Because, again, history has taught us, has taught me, that uh, the guerrillas are experts in taking advantage of ceasefires. And in the past, the upper hand militarily was in their hands, not in ours. Today, the situation is different. So it's against the interest of the, of the state, of the government, to have a ceasefire. But more importantly, if we want to get rid of the conflict, uh, if we want to end the conflict, then let's end it once and for all. But if you, make a cease, if, if you, if you agree a ceasefire and they maintain their arms, there's a perverse incentive to prolong the negotiations eternally. So that's one of the reasons why we uh, made this, this condition, we imposed this condition. Uh, of course, it's difficult uh, to explain to the common, uh, to a common person that you are talking in Havana and shooting in, in Colombia. Uh, there's an apparent contradiction. You have to be, you have to be very ped pedagogic. Uh, you have to teach them uh, and explain to them clearly why this is better than a ceasefire. Or, for example, the, the uh, condition that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And the agreements must be, uh, in a way, secret. They cannot be made uh, um, public until we have the whole agreement. Why did we put this condition? For a very simple reason. Uh, we agreed on an agenda, and each item of the agenda by itself is liable to be misinterpreted or simply misused by the enemies of the process. If you ask the Colombian people, would you like uh, the FARC to participate in politics, the majority say no. These people have been only kidnapping, killing, uh, uh, recruiting kids, uh, they sh deserve nothing. You ask the people, uh, would you like the FARC to be members of uh, Congress? They, people automatically say no. They don't deserve to be in Congress, they are X and Y, and. They, they certainly not. But if you ask the people for a whole package, you know, with this ingredient and this other ingredient, and uh, there will be a, uh, they will give up their arms, and they will uh, peace will come, and these are the benefits. When you have the whole package, people will say yes. It's like I, I use the analogy of a a painter who wants to sell his painting. He won't allow the, uh, the potential buyer to come into his studio and see the painting when it's 15% or 30% or 50% painted, no. He wants to complete the painting and then show it to the prospective buyer and says, you buy it or not? And that's what I'm trying to do with the Colombian people. I say, wait, uh, wait until we have the whole agreement. And you will have the opportunity. This is the first time that uh, a country is going to put to the people uh, the decision, the ultimate decision, if there is peace or not. And uh, we, I have promised that uh, when we have the agreement, this will be put to some kind of 
referendum or some kind of decision by the people. And we are the first country who is negotiating under the Treaty of Rome. And so in, in a way we're becoming a, a precedent for other countries that would in the future would like to solve conflicts in the way we are doing. So we, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way we're becoming a guinea pig uh, in the solution of conflicts. Uh, I was telling, I was discussing this yesterday with the uh, Attorney General of the International Penal Court in Colombia is, is now a precedent uh, and uh, we must be very careful on, on giving the correct signals and, and hopefully doing things the better, the correct way in order not only to succeed in our peace but to leave a precedent for future cases of conflict resolution. So we're in that stage. Uh, I say that building peace is not only uh, silencing the rifles uh, and what is being agreed in Havana, but doing the other things that I, I, I was explaining. More social investment and effective social investment, more equality, more social justice, that's a way of building peace. And uh, I am hopeful uh, that uh, we can, uh, uh, we can uh, reach an agreement and that uh, my kids and uh, my grandkids will see a country and enjoy a country in peace. I haven't been able to enjoy one day of peace. My generation or the generation that has followed me uh, have had to live in a country in war. And um, as I said at the beginning, we get accustomed to that, but we should not. It's terrible. More than 220,000 people have died. That's more than double of the people that were killed in Bosnia. And we have more than five million people displaced. And every day I encounter terrible examples of what this war means. I, I mentioned an example a couple of days ago. Uh, it's, it was a very recent example. We are uh, giving away uh, houses to the very, very poor that don't even have a, a, the possibility of saving one, one peso. And we, we're allowing them to have access to to a decent house, and uh, this person came, he had uh, lost a leg, and uh, I, he came up and I gave him the keys to his, to his new house, and I said, uh, congratulations, uh, what happened to your leg? And he said, I lost it in the war. And I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, but now you can enjoy your family uh, uh, in this new house, and I explained what the house was, and, and he said, uh, well, I'm sorry, Mr. President, but I I'm, will not be able to do that. And I said, why? Because my wife and my two kids were assassinated by this war also. Uh, these are the types of drama that I encounter every single day, and that's what I hope we can stop in Colombia. Colombia is a great country with great potential, and if we are able to uh, find peace and release the real potential of all Colombians, then sky is the limit. Thank you. We now have some time for questions, and as evidently some of you know, the way to ask a question is to line up uh, behind a microphone, and I will be going through and calling upon those who have lined up. Um, I also want to remind those of you who have been here before and inform those of you who are at the forum for the first time that uh, there, are, there is, first of all, the spirit that my colleague, Professor Grindle, indicated before, this is about dialogue, respectful, civilized, 
in, a, uh, in our university. Uh, but specifically, uh, when you ask a question, you start by saying your name and your affiliation. Um, you then are brief. Uh, and thirdly, whenever you end your brief statement, uh, I ought to be able to hear a question at the end. And so I will begin with a question for you. Uh, why is this time different? So there have been negotiations between the FARC and the Colombian government in the past. In the 1980s, some from the FARC who put down their weapons joined the Unión Patriotica were then assassinated. Uh, under the Pastrana presidency, there was a ceasefire and the FARC violated it and took advantage of it. What today would give the FARC reason to believe that its members would not be assassinated if they lay down their weapons? And what today would give you confidence that the FARC would put down its weapons under the rule of law in Colombia and join the law and the Constitution? Well, I think the conditions of Colombia today are very, very different from what they were 10 or 15 years ago. Starting by something that I mentioned, which is the military balance. Uh, during the Pastrana administration, and I was a member of that administration, I was Minister of Finance, uh, the guerrillas had an upper hand in, uh, in their military capacity in many areas of, of Colombia. They really controlled. Uh, we started then a process of strengthening our military. Uh, we started Plan Colombia with the United States, which has been probably the most successful bipartisan foreign policy initiative that the United States has made in the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years. And uh, so it's, it's a different conditions. Uh, we now have control of the territory. And for the first time, they have even made this explicit. They know that through armed struggle, they will not achieve anything. They will not achieve power. And uh, they realize that this is the moment. Now, the world condition, the regional condition also favors a negotiated settlement today. Uh, Venezuela and Cuba are helping us. They are say, uh, guerrilla warfare today is anachronic. This is not the way to go. And so the conditions are different. And we have also, they have learned and we have learned uh, in terms of the guarantees, which is exactly what we're negotiating. What guarantees will we, we will give them in order for them to feel that we can uh, operate in a democracy that will not assassinate them like what happened with the Union Patriotic? Thank you. We get over here. Thank you. My name is Juan Remolina. I'm a HKS student of the MPA program. Uh, Mr. President, you mentioned that it's time to stop the conflict. And one of the main drivers of the conflict is corruption. And the Colombian government has implemented several strategies in order to fight against corruption. Um, however, according to the last results of the World Economic Forum, corruption reaches the highest and historical levels as the most problematic factor for doing business in Colombia. And what is more distressful um, the percentage of Colombians who justify corruption has increased for the first time in the last four years. So my question is, do you think Colombians' efforts against corruption have been enough? If not, what should be the next steps? Thank you very much. Yes, corruption has been a, a terrible problem in our country. Uh, if I say, if I ask what, to myself, what has been one of the worst consequences of, of having drug trafficking in Colombia is that it corrupted the moral fiber of our society. And we have been trying to uh, fight corruption in, in every way possible. We institutionally uh, set a, a special uh, advisor to the president with power to implement anti-corruption policies. 
we approved in Congress for the first time uh, a very severe anti-corruption law. This was, had never happened before. And we are discovering uh, cases of corruption that before were hidden. And uh, this has an effect of people saying, wow, look at the corruption. The corruption was always there. But we're fighting it and we're focusing the light of the government and of public opinion on the, on the most dramatic cases. This has a short-term uh, negative impact on perception. People say, look at, look at what happened, look at the, look what, uh, what they discovered. Uh, and they say corruption has gone up. But in fact, corruption has gone, is, is starting to come down in terms of uh, the breaks that we are putting uh, in the different uh, cases where we have been able to, uh, to work uh, effectively and concretely. Uh, this is a, an ongoing struggle. Um, as I say, one of the legacies of drug trafficking has been uh, corruption in every echelon of the Colombian society, but I, I truly believe that we are making progress uh, towards a more transparent country. I myself uh, learned here in the Kennedy School uh, the importance of transparency of good government, uh, the <coughs> principles of good government, which is transparency, accountability, efficiency, uh, and these are the ones that we're trying to apply in Colombia. Buenas noches. Es un placer tenerlo aquí. My name is Tiffany Lazo. I'm from San Juan, Puerto Rico, and I will be asking the official Twitter question on behalf of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Um, the question is, what opportunities do you see for involvement for youth within and outside of Colombia? What opportunities for the youth? Involvement um, both within and outside of Colombia. Um, well, we, in, in Colombia, uh, the, what we're trying to, to create is opportunities for the young people. Uh, we have a problem. I think this is a, not only a Colombian problem, problem in many areas of the world where unemployment is concentrated in the young people. From 18 to 26, uh, the unemployment rate is even double what it is on the uh, national average. And so we are trying to uh, give opportunities to young people by, first of all, giving them more access to, to the educational structure. Uh, one of the bottlenecks that we have is precisely that. People, now that we have free education uh, for basic and secondary education, they graduate from high school, and there's a bottleneck there. And we're trying to address that uh, bottleneck by creating more opportunities. Um, we uh, stimulate the participation of, of, of young people in, in discussions around the country, make them aware politically, make them aware that uh, their contribution or their, dis their participation is, is um, important. Uh, we have a special office to stimulate that. Uh, it's, I, I tell you, sometimes it's not easy. Uh, you find skepticism, you find uh, cynicism, but uh, you have to continue trying and, and uh, find ways uh, through, for example, technology uh, to convince the, the young people to, to participate more. Uh, I think one of the assets that, that we have in Colombia and in Latin America is that we have uh, a young population. This is, must be a, an asset and, and not a problem, uh, but you have to offer them better and better opportunities. Um, buenas tardes. Um, thank you, Mr. President, for being with us today. Um, my name is Hillary Higgins, and I am a junior here at the college um, with Colombian parents. Um, and my question is, um, if the peace, uh, the peace um, negotiations are successful, then what strategies could your administration or the next administration implement to sort of impede the formation of criminal bans um, that often arise out of the demobilization of guerrilla groups, such as that, those that arose out of the demobilization of the paramilitary groups. 
um, that are still a problem in the nation today? Thank you. That's a good question. Um, we are now starting to think in what they call a post-conflict. And one of the issues that we have to address is precisely the one you mentioned. Many times after a, a, the resolution of a conflict like Colombia, the, the, what, what, what is left over is increased violence. People who have only been taught to shoot and to kill, and many of them don't, don't learn so, something different and they're easily recruited, especially uh, if you have, for example, drug trafficking. They are very easily recruited. So we are addressing that by different methods. First, we included in the agenda of the negotiations, and I, I did it uh, with purpose, the subject of drug trafficking. Why did I do that? Because if the FARC say, and they have said always that they're not, not drug traffickers, they only tax the drug traffickers, and if they're going to legalize themselves, then they should be in the side of the, of the state to combat the drug trafficking. And if they switch sides and we're able, and this is one of my dreams, to have a, uh, a Colombia free of conflict and free of coca, and we have been able to reduce 70% the production of coca, this would be a dramatic, dramatic change, not only in Colombia, the whole region, and in the United States, because we have been the, the principal providers of cocaine in, in the U.S. market. So, uh, uh, and, and you take away that incentive. At the same time, we have had a, a good experience uh, with uh, many faults, many errors that we have committed, but the experience with the paramilitary on what they call the demobilization, how you integrate them into society. Uh, there, we have learned that we have to stimulate the businessmen <coughs> to, to accept uh, people who were in arms as a normal person, part of society. <coughs> that is something that we're starting to do uh, already, and uh, this is a big challenge. And also, uh, I hope that we can negotiate uh, a, a transfer, uh, tra a transition <coughs> with, the, with the FARC in order to uh, give them some kind of help to, be, to uh, make their members uh, productive citizens. <coughs> uh, good evening, President Santos. Um, my name is Antonio Copete. I am a postdoc at the Center for Astrophysics here at Harvard, uh, and I'm from Colombia. Um, I, uh, my question uh, comes from, from um, originally from when I, I heard you in your uh, inauguration speech when you uh, were, I think, probably the first president in history who said the word science and technology uh, in, in your speech. And uh, well, I was very impressed by that. And uh, you know, for, with some of the future developments, like for example, the, the visit of the governor of Massachusetts this year. Um, at the same time, there's been some worrying signs for me as a, as a, as a, as a Colombian researcher abroad. Uh, for example, um, I was on declarations by, by the, by the um, head of Colciencias of just a few weeks ago when she said that basically Colombia didn't offer uh, the conditions for, for, for Colombian uh, researchers abroad to, to go back, to come back home. Um, so I would like to hear directly from you what your uh, uh, vision is uh, when it comes to scientific and technological development for Colombia, specifically in the areas of, of, of research and, and innovation. Thank you. In politics, uh, you show your love through the budget. Uh, they say that's, that's a, uh, a very crude way, but uh, a frank way to say it. No, if you like education, you put a bu you put more budget in education. If you like uh, the sports, you give sports more budget. In the case of research and development, for the first time in Colombia, there in the reform that we approved in Congress, ten percent, ten percent of the royalties of Colombia 
go to uh, research and development. Uh, this is a, an increase of, I don't know, 100%, and not 100%, 100 times what they had before. Uh, the challenge now is how to use that uh, more, uh, how to use those resources uh, uh, effectively. There's, as always, a competition between the pure scientists or the innovators in the business world. You know, they say, no, no, this money should go to innovation of productive uh, processes in the industry or in the agriculture. Uh, others say, no, no, this should go to basic research. We must concentrate the resources and, and create the sufficient the critical mass of uh, researchers in order to, have, to start a virtual circle. We're in the process of, of discussing that. Uh, we now are accumulating the resources um, and uh, we have to decide how to, how to best use those resources. I must confess that uh, I am a bit um, sorry that I didn't think about the institutionality of innovation. Innovation, uh, when, when my development plan was, was published, we had five locomotives. We said the engines of growth of our economy would be uh, infrastructure, the, the agricultural sector, housing, oil and mining, and innovation. Innovation has been the most important factor in the growth of most of the Asian countries. They increase their productivity through innovation. Latin America in general, Colombia is one, is part of Latin America, we have very low productivity. The culture of innovation was just starting to, to, uh, to stimulate it. And uh, I failed in, in not, in not uh, uh, thinking of a, of a good, uh, institutionality to promote innovation. And I think we must uh, address that uh, vacuum uh, soon in order to be more effective in the use of those resources. Question over here. Hello, and thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Carolyn Roderer, and I'm a junior here at the college, as well as a member of the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum Committee. And tonight, I'm asking the official question on behalf of the committee. In the past, you've expressed concern about climate change, but given the importance of the oil and gas industries to Colombia's economy, how do you reconcile your desires for a strong economy and your desire to combat climate change? And how can Colombia respond to these shifting needs going forward? Great question. And I, I question myself every day on, on that issue. Uh, Colombia is a very rich country in terms of uh, oil and minerals. And we are extremely rich in terms of biodiversity. We are the richest country in the world in biodiversity per square kilometer. And uh, how to address that? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, yesterday morning, uh, 8 o'clock in, in, in the morning, we launched an initiative that has been chaired by Felipe Calderón, former president of Mexico who is now in the Institute of Politics. He's chairing this commission. We launched it with the Prime Minister of Norway, seven countries that uh, we're going to try and find an answer to that question. How can you make economic efficiency compatible with uh, the need to stop the climate change and to protect the environment? N nobody has the answer yet, the real answer. It, uh, in, in Colombia, we're trying to do uh, as much as possible. For example, a couple of weeks ago, we declared a national park, uh, Chile, we get the, the size of Belgium. Nobody can come in, nobody can exploit it, no deforestation, no mineral uh, resources can be exploited. Um, Senator Leahy said uh, that that decree uh, was more uh, did more for uh, the climate change than many countries have been doing in the whole lifetime. Uh, we are trying to protect our biodiversity in many ways. Uh, one of the 
ways to protect biodiversity is to address poverty. When, uh, people, people who are in a bad shape, they go and simply uh, cut down trees because they need to live. And so a good social uh, agenda is also a way to address this problem. But this is uh, the big challenge that the world has and a great challenge that Colombia has. Colombia is a very vulnerable country uh, in terms of climate change. When I, I'll, I'll tell you an anecdote. When I was inaugurated, I went before Congress, I went to the Indians of the Sierra Nevada. They are the oldest Indians in Colombia and very wise. And I said, I come to you and ask your permission to take over the government. And they consider that a, a, a good gesture. And uh, they said, well, we wish you luck, but you're, you're, going to have, you're going to start paying a high price. And it's not going to be your fault. It's a high price that your country is going to pay for many, many decades of neglecting Mother Nature. And uh, in the next year, year and a half, you're going to pay the price. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, you are not to blame, but you are going to pay. And the worst uh, floodings and the worst uh, rains that we have had in our history, the worst natural disaster uh, came to us, and I had to spend many, many, uh, uh, a big part of my budget and a big part of, of the energy of the government addressing this problem. Uh, so it's, we have learned. I remember Vice President Gore going to Colombia and telling us something similar, saying, Colombia is ex extremely vulnerable. You're very rich and you are becoming a sort of a, an example. And what you do, people will, will analyze it very carefully. We participated very actively in the Rio summit. Uh, we were the ones who proposed the sustainable development goals. Uh, we made part of the panel with Prime Minister Cameron of, of uh, making these goals uh, uh, measurable, and, and we're working hard on that. But I confess to you, we don't have the exact or correct answer. We are working on it. Thank you. Last question over here. Hi. Um, my name is Jonas Haltzman. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, you mentioned that uh, when you came into office, you inherited a deficit of 18 billion pesos, and you now have a surplus of, of 2 billion pesos. <coughs> um, and you did that all while making significant investments in, I think you said, education, access to technology, infrastructure. So I'm wondering how you, what policies or strategies allowed you to achieve those, those uh, maybe contrary goals at the same time? What policies, what? Sorry? Uh, could you ask? What, poli <laughs> what policies or strategies allowed you to make significant investments oh. At the same time. While, improve, while okay. eliminating your deficit. Uh, good. Uh, yes, I, I, uh, apparently it's a contradiction. You spend more, yet you reduce the deficit. Uh, we increased by roughly 40, 45% the revenues through uh, eliminating tax breaks for the very rich and through more efficiency in the uh, tax in the, in the administration of the, of the, of the taxes, of how, how you collect the taxes. And uh, also, the economy grew faster, and then therefore you got more, uh, more revenues. The royalties went up substantially. You got more revenues. So we were able to, we were lucky, but we were able to uh, combine more investment, and uh, hopefully the investment will produce more revenue in the future. Uh, and that's, that's the, the way we're approaching that. For example, infrastructure. The, the infrastructure, what we're doing is, there is a, a scheme called the private-public associations. Uh, there, through those schemes, you, you use the private sector and the private capital to do 
a lot of the work that the government uh, usually does in, in investing, for example, in infrastructure. So we're using different combinations of uh, to use more efficiently the scarce resources that we every government has. I want to close by thanking you, Mr. President, for the, your remarks, uh, for answering uh, so many questions. I want to thank everyone uh, that is here, and in particular, I want to thank you on behalf of the faculty and students of the university. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, even if you have a ticket for the next event, we need you to exit through the Parkside exit. So anyone who has a ticket or doesn't have a ticket, we need you to exit through the Parkside. Thank you so much and have a great night.